All right, welcome to UC Santa Barbara's Innovator Story Series. I'm John Greathouse. You can follow me on Twitter, at John Greathouse. A sponsor tonight is HG Insights, powered by the largest and most granular set of install and IT spend data. HG Insights allows you to identify sales opportunities with the highest revenue potential. So what it really does is it gives you knowledge that allows you to take your sales and marketing resources, your salespeople, your marketing dollars, and focus them on the opportunities that are going to net you the most revenue. Fantastic company. If you're interested in learning more, you, there's a short video after our interview that you can um, watch and you can learn, learn, learn a little bit more about what HG Insights is doing. So tonight, I'm super excited to be talking with Ginny Du. She's the co-founder and vice president of operations at Appeal Sciences. Ginny earned her bachelor's degree in engineering chemistry, and her, that just hurts my brain to even think about engineering chemistry and her PhD in chemistry from Queen's University, which is in Kingston, Ontario, in a small country called Canada. During her graduate studies, I was born in Canada, I could make Canadian jokes. During her graduate studies, she was awarded the Alexander, Alexander Graham Bell Canada Graduate Scholarship by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. And that was in recognition of her research work. Following completion of her doctoral degree after she got her PhD, she joined the chemistry department here at UC Santa Barbara as a postdoctoral researcher where she worked for two years before joining Appeal as its co-founder and director of extraction engineering. She's now the VP of operations, as I mentioned, and her responsibilities are pretty broad, pretty, uh, pretty uh, vast. She leads up regulatory affairs and compliance, manufacturing, quality control, supply chain, logistics, IT, and facilities. So like often happens at companies as they're growing and emerging, uh, the senior leadership has to wear a lot of hats and get a lot of things done. Um, and Ginny is no exception to that. Let's give her a very warm UCSB welcome. Whoa, All right. we are live. This we is crazy. We are live, yeah. And we're not going to edit anything. It doesn't matter what happens. Fun. Craziness up here. Um, so I know that I think one of your catchphrases at Appeal is seeing is believing. Mm -hmm. So before we um, go into our conversation, I want to pause for a moment, and we're going to uh, show a video that has time-lapsed um, analysis of what your product is able to do. Yeah, no, that would be great. It's, uh, it really started at a time, too, when we were trying to describe how our product worked for folks. And then we just decided if we could show um, people what the results, what the performance of the product could look like, right. um, that it would kind of trump all, you know, showing a graph, written word. Words and data are no substitute for story. Yeah. Yep. So the time lapse videos have been, you know, built using in house um, tools, yep. optimized in house ever since, and it's been a really big part, a really important part of how we tell our story. Great. Let's take a look. So it's quite impressive the number of different fruits and vegetables that are shown in that video. And we'll touch upon mm -hmm. which ones you have approval for, which ones you're focused on. But that always um, surprises me when I see that video. I forget how many uh, fruits and vegetables are applicable to this technology. Let, I want to start with um, getting personal. So your home life growing up. What, what kind of family did you come from? Some, some, some folks that I interviewed came from very entrepreneurial families. Some come from very academic families. How would you characterize your, your upbringing? Mm. We're a super blue collar family um, up in Canada, like in my introduction. But my family, we're Chinese, uh, like historically. Um, we've been running away from communism for a few generations <laughs> now. So my parents are born in Vietnam, and they mm. are um, Refugees, they're boat people. 
um, immigrated to Canada in like the late 70s. So they were Chinese that mm -hmm. went to Vietnam? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. And then, and then they had to... things turned again, so then they left again. Um, so yeah, I'll, you know, my father has not, he, um, the highest grade level that he reached actually was sixth grade. Uh, my mom made it through to the end of high school, but they've always been folks like, like welders um, and stuff like that. So I think for us it was more that um, the value of education was something that was really important. Um, our parents were too, you know, busy. We had four kids in the house, and my dad probably worked like seven days a week, and so there wasn't a lot of time like spent like fostering us. But the the point of it was, um, you know, we've come here to provide you an opportunity that we ourselves couldn't have, and so it was a, you know, I call it like a familial responsibility to try to see that through. So, not a very entrepreneurial family though, because with with a lot of that. Change and turmoil comes an expectation for like you know something like stable mm -hmm. um, would be uh, very much valued. So I am kind of I guess a black sheep in my family. I'm the only one um, I guess formally uh, following an entrepreneurial path, and I wouldn't I didn't know that that was maybe like a suitable path for me um, like throughout all of my schooling. Um, so my sisters, I have three sisters, and they've followed maybe more traditional paths. Um, two of them are optometrists, one is oh. a dentist. Um, so I remember my father actually said to me, like, you've been in school a long time, <laughs> like going to graduate school. And he's like, what are you going to do afterwards? And I was like, I still don't know. You know, when you pursue um, a, a more open-ended degree, like you just pursue chemistry, that could mean a variety of different things for opportunities. So he was like, what do you mean you've been in school all this time? You don't know what you're going to do. Um, so it was a little bit concerning, I think, to ask, to t let him know, like, hey, I'm going to join this company. And at the time, I was, like, living in a garage in mm. Goleta, and then I was mm. going to go work in a garage on the Mesa. And I was like, well, I don't know how this is going to go over. <laughs> um, but I think there is a part of my family that was, like, um, you know, that they wish they, wish they were bigger risk takers, which uh -huh. is a funny thing to, like, get on a boat and like bet your life on the boat, that's a pretty big risk to take. Right. Um, but in this case, it was, um, you know, my dad just said, well, if it doesn't work, I guess you just go and you try something else. And I was like, what have you done with my father? Right, right, right. <laughs> What's Who said going that? on? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's, I would say, definitely not um, like a formally entrepreneurial background. Right. But. Well, I always like exploring that because we have a lot of students uh, in the room and also watching it um, around the world that are, dealing with a similar situation in their lives. So maybe their parents wanted them, they had aspirations for their kids to be mm -hmm. X and their kids want to be Y. And I get a lot of the conversations in office hours and it really does come down to you have to make that decision and you, ultimately your parents will support you and be happy for you even if in the short term they're frustrated by your decision. Mm -hmm. And it's actually not uncommon. Um, I know research has been done on um, entrepreneurs whose family lives were a little bit more chaotic or, or not as stable. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the parents reject entrepreneurship because they see that as a continuation of that mm -hmm. lack of stability, um, which yeah. is understandable. It's completely rational. Yeah. I think you, you've obviously made a great choice, and I think you're gonna, you're, all your family's going to be proud of you. <laughs> Thanks. But you have, to, you, have to, you have to make your own decisions, right? Your yeah, I spent like generation, or decades like wearing my parents down. Okay. <laughs> I'm the oldest one in the family. Um, they're pretty traditional Asian in some ways, and... So uh, there was always, uh, I would say, a cultural conflict at home. Mm. So you just kind of get to a point where you're like, I, I promise I'm not in a gang. Like, we're doing all the right <laughs> things. Like, just trust me on this one. And, and so we're in a good place now. But, yeah. Jimmy's doing it again. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because the firstborn is typically the one that's, and I'm not talking about Chinese mm -hmm. families, mm -hmm. every family, the firstborn typically is the more the rule follower mm -hmm. and the pleaser. So you broke all the rules. What, no. <laughs> what, what got you to, so you're, let's go back to when you were getting your, your, your uh, master, or your, excuse me, your PhD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You successfully complete your PhD. What drove you to come here to UC Santa Barbara? Yeah, um, so I, I actually never had a goal to be an academic, even though I've been in academics for a long time. Just really loved learning. And so if you have a chance to explore research and you're like, wow, this is amazing. All the things that, all this knowledge that can be generated across all these different fields. And for me, it wasn't specific to any one field. But um, at the time, my graduate work was in a different area. It was uh, materials to be put onto fiber optic cables to make a uh, sensor that could act remotely 
to detect uh, metal contamination in water as like one potential application. But in my mind, I had started reading about um, organic solar cells, so flexible solar panels, mm -hmm. and more about, um, for me, probably finding a path of like meaningful work and something I was like, energy is where it's at. I was like, if this, this comes from the sun for free every day, <laughs> and you know, what we, what the radiation that hits us, us on the earth, you know, could power us for several uh, decades, right? <laughs> And so it was like, this is an untapped resource. And if we don't have the energy to um, continue operating all the things that uphold our lives, you know, then like what else, what else like really matters? Um, and so I wanted to switch fields and thought that if I was going to work in the flexible solar cell industry that I probably needed some experience in it because I didn't do it at all in graduate school. And so actually here at UC Santa Barbara, there's a really big concentration of professors that work in the organic electronics field. Solar panels is one of those yeah. things, but transistors, et cetera, um, light emitting uh, devices. And so it was more the concentration of those experts here in Santa Barbara, um, a very strong material science um, research department. The facilities that were here it was sort of like, wow, like maybe that could sort of catapult it for me. But like nothing goes in a straight line. I showed up and my research advisors like, I've got a new project for you. <laughs> and it wasn't organic solar cells like at all. It was to use similar kinds of materials to um, add to these uh, fuel cells that were built using like wastewater. So using the mic microorganisms that are in wastewater, digesting the organic matter to try to harness electricity from that. And so it was like, it's like kind of related, but not. And then like now I work at a fruit company, you know? <laughs> like, so it's more probably about just taking advantage of the opportunities as they come, uh, rather than maybe like that a perfectly prescribed path is gonna work out. Yep. So. And, and you mentioned something that I've seen very common with entrepreneurs and academics. And so that's where when an academic becomes an entrepreneur, it's that curiosity and that love of learning. I know as an entrepreneur, I was thrown into situations where I had to learn about, you know, stuff like cardiac surgery or things I had no basis in. But I actually really enjoyed it because I was getting mm -hmm. the privilege of being taught by some of the smartest people in those industries. So I always felt like that was just such a benefit for me. Yeah. But if you don't have that point of view, it can be a burden. Like, oh, now I got to learn this and now I got to learn that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. Yeah. So it's, it's not surprising that we do see academics intersect with entrepreneurship. And we have to give a shout out to Next um, Energy yeah. in Santa Barbara. There's a company called Next Energy, look it up, um, that's doing some really cool stuff with, with windows and actually taking solar energy as it hits a window and converting it into electricity. Yeah, um, yeah we've yeah. actually all come out of the same uh, yeah. like research family. Right, right. Yeah. Lots of good stuff happening at UC Santa Barbara. So I think one of the students had a question similar to this. Apologize for stealing your question um, or co-opting your question. Um, when, when, when you look back, mm -hmm. knowing the path, obviously, that you've taken, but you didn't know it at the time, what, do you wish you had taken certain business courses? Or do you wish there was certain curriculum you had studied mm -hmm. that when you're at work today, you're saying, oh, I just wish I had a little bit of an academic standing in this? Um, yes and no. I think. Uh... I'll just kind of like, I'll take it one step back. I think when you're in school, you know, it's really about like, do you know enough? Like you as an individual, you as an individual contributor. And then when you go out into like the rest of the world, what's actually super important is like, how well do you work in teams? And how is the success or the yeah. achievement of that team? And so if anything, I think what's been really beneficial is to recognize complementary skills and attributes between, for example, like myself and other folks on our leadership team. Mm -hmm. um, because there are actually some things that like, I really admire James, our CEO and founder for, yep. because he's got a very business driven entrepreneurial mindset. I'm more like the doer, like he'll have an idea and, and say like, 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 can we do this? And then my, I just almost right away tend to go and like, we're figuring out like, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. Um, so sometimes I wish I had more of his brain, like, cause I'm really bad at being like, how do I monetize that? Like, that's just <laughs> not how my brain like works at all. Um, so sometimes I, I would like, you know, a little bit more exposure to that. I think as the company grows at some point you have to like manage a budget. And I was like, I don't even manage a budget in my personal life. So like, how am I going to do that for my team? <laughs> so there's probably some like nuts and bolts that would be helpful. 
um, not like hindering yet. And a lot of that is more just because we've been able to rely on like a broader network of right. expertise. But I think it's like so amazing to see the technology management program, the master's in technology management, like just having everybody uh, really like see a glimpse of that just gives you a, a different kind of boost, you know, when you come in. Um, now it's to take that in academic um, theory, what you've learned, and really like put that to practice in the next place you all go. But um, I mean, it, it's, it certainly it couldn't have hurt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's actually the technology management program, which is what this this class is a part of, came out of the that very mm -hmm. philosophy. We had one class originally, and it was to help people like Yulin Wong, who founded the robotics mm -hmm. company that I was involved with, and Klaus Schauser, who founded GoToMeeting products. Uh, they were fantastic academics, but didn't have the basics of business. And the idea, and they both became incredible business people. But yeah. it's the idea was, could we propel their success if they had a, a foundation, a little bit of accounting, mm -hmm. a little bit of finance, a little bit of the jargon? Basically. Yeah, I think actually maybe the last thing I would add to that maybe is like, as a trained as a scientist, we're pretty married to like the beauty of the idea. Mm. Um, the elegance of the science and the idea. But then actually to make it work in a business setting, that's like the first like 1%. <laughs> right. And so to actually carry over from just like an idea um, into true like innovation and application requires a whole bunch of other stuff, which is exactly everything that you're covering in your courses. Yep. And so I think for us, fortunately, and this is kind of compared to other stories, but some folks can be in this setting, like too married to their original idea um, and not maybe willing to listen to the feedback, you know, from your customers, from your stakeholders as to what um, might alternatively be possible mm -hmm. or help it gain traction. So the willingness to, I guess, be listen and um, to listen and to be open to that is really important. Right, right. Um, but I think in our our side like that, I think the the disposition of our group meant that we kind of recognized that right away, but I think that can be a really hard lesson for folks if you come purely just from your technical training and haven't seen what it really takes to like build a successful yeah. business. A lot of technologists, I mean, the, the, where they've been trained is right and wrong, black and white. Mm -hmm. It's either this way or it's that way, mm -hmm. which is true in science often. It's right. seldom ever true in business. There's mm -hmm. always gradients of truth. Right. Um, you mentioned the complement, complementary team, hugely important in business, mm -hmm. and I also think one of the ways you get to a complementary team is being very self-aware and being very honest about what you're good at and what you're not good at, what you mm -hmm. want to do versus what you have to do. Did that, did that kind of evolve organically for your team? Uh, or had you already worked together enough to where you kind of went mm -hmm. in knowing where the different roles? Yeah, um, James and Lou, like two, so James, our CEO and founder, and Lou, another like founding team member, um, shared the same office like all through graduate school so I think they knew each other quite well um, but I interfaced with them more like peripherally through our research group so I think like early on when you're getting started you only choose really people you know mm -hmm. people you can really trust because mm -hmm. you're kind of in the trenches together you're taking on a lot of risk and uncertainty and you're sort of going like who among because not all your friends are hireable <laughs> like you know you have like some are like really great friends and then you're like some are like friends you can rely on to like really dot i's and like cross t's <laughs> um so you got to know like which bucket of friends you're drawing from right um, but i think in this case like what was helpful was that there's there's you just got to leave your ego at the door because it's not about like any individual yep. having all the answers it's about achieving um it's about achieving as uh, as a team you know together yep and so I think once you realize that like we were going to get farther by dividing and conquering in the ways that are most complementary to our skill sets, that that um, was more valuable to us. Yep. Yeah. And I would say don't underestimate that that um, chemistry between your founding team. Mm -hmm. It usually doesn't get better. So yeah. as it gets mm -hmm. more stressful, as the stakes get higher, as you start hiring people, it mm -hmm. doesn't typically get better. But if you have a good foundation and you get along on an elemental level, then totally. it'll work, right? Yeah. I, I want to talk about the mission of Appeal, and then I want to talk about the, the, the origin story. I always love to hear the mm -hmm. origin stories. But over a third of all the food is wasted in the, mm -hmm. you know, in the world, which is ridiculous. Um, part of it is, and most of it spoils before we eat it, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's either spoils in the field or on the way or in the store or, or at home. Um, in the developing world, it's half of all the food. Mm -hmm. So think about that. When we're talking about how do we feed people, we could feed twice as many people if we could just reduce 
uh, that spoilage. So reducing food, food waste is the obvious thing you guys are doing, but you're also reducing the amount of water that's needed, mm -hmm. the amount of energy that's required to grow those crops. Um, for those that aren't familiar with the origin story, kind of walk us through how we got to where you are today with, with all sure. of these fruits and vegetables. But how did it start? Yeah. Um, so like n none of us were in fresh fruit or vegetables or food or plants really <laughs> like to begin with at all. Um, and so in this particular case, um, it was James, you know, we, um, the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization had published some reports recently um, with the numbers around how much food was being wasted. And in this particular case, it's just like, it's like that nagging idea that you just can't let go, you know? Mm. Um, so he was Those doing a drive. Kind. Yeah, doing a drive between Santa Barbara and the Berkeley area, because we um, usually go up there to use some of the facilities there for our research. And you kind of drive through really like the most abundant parts of California, like all that beautiful farmland. And you go like, wait, you mean we throw half of this away? Mm -hmm. And also with the numbers that we have to double our food production in order to sustain a growing global population. But yet you can't necessarily, as though, although we try to um, increase our yields, like what we can actually like produce at any time, like that's quite limited. So in this case, it was just like, whoa, this is almost like egregious. There's got to be a better way. And so you just, it just starts with like a nagging idea and you just ask questions and you ask more questions and you ask more questions. Yep. So it was, wait, well, how do, we how do we protect food now? And so refrigeration ends up becoming, you know, it's like the first, you know, first thing you do when you come home, you like pop everything in the fridge and, you know, your most perishable stuff in the grocery store, it's also kept cold. Um, and so what you realize is like, wait, like we've been farming for a long time and is refrigeration in some ways like the best that we can do, especially after harvest. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of challenging, you know, that thinking a little bit. And then it was like, well, how do plants protect themselves? Um, cause a lot of it is, you know, you're growing on the plant, but as soon as you're picked off, it's like the time bomb starting to tick, right. And it's starting to perish. So, um, and it was really that the development of appeal, um, most plants were basically all of us were like underwater at some point evolved to be on the surface of the earth in a much drier um, challenging climate and it was the formation of a peel that helped to retain moisture and protect you from oxidation um, due to exposure to the atmosphere so it was like huh like could we by reinforcing the natural peel or that top layer of fresh fruits and vegetables could we mitigate against these primary drivers for um, perishability, which is water loss and oxidation. And do it in a, obviously, or highly organic, yeah. non-chemical non, non right. way. So you can't, you know, it's, it's food, so you have to be pretty specific. You have to be pretty thoughtful, I guess, in like what materials you're gonna use. It can't be like a super designer, quote unquote, plastic. Nobody wants to, no one's gonna feel comfortable right. eating that. So we had to really look at the building blocks of materials that plants themselves already use. So they're in the foods um, that we already eat. Right, mm -hmm. and you find that with a, with a lot of great ideas, and I do consider this a great idea, that the, when you first come across it, it mm -hmm. seems so obvious, and then you start to get worried that other people are gonna do it. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't somebody else thought of this? It's such a good idea. I, and and I, know, I know that team, the team felt that way, um, and when I think back to the, you know, the creation of container shipping, for instance, which we all take for granted, might be the single um, greatest cost saver of the last century is shipping things through containers and not the old fashioned mm -hmm. way. And that was a, a hunch that took um, about 20 years to manifest itself because it was hard. Mm -hmm. It was complicated. Railroad shipping, yeah. you know, but it was such a good idea. You know, it eventually came to the fore, but it's about execution, right? Yep, the idea alone exactly. is worth very little. It's it's getting it's doing the hard work to get it uh, in the market. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take uh, two students' questions. Let's, let's we'll take the first one now. How do you balance leading so many different sectors within appeal? Yeah, um, it's a it's a perfect example of you physically cannot do it all yourself, and about the importance of then of um, building a really great team. So. Um, our operations team, like each of those functions, you know, at some point I maybe I was the one doing it just to start it, but then it became big enough that we wanted to like hire somebody in to take on like responsibility of those areas. So I'm very close to the work, um, but I, we're at a place right now where like if I wanted to hang on to all those pieces, I would become actually a bottleneck to the business. 
So at some point you just have to figure out like, what is it about somebody that you would trust to bring them onto your team so that you can share that responsibility with them. Um, a lot of it is coming up with some structures so that you can actually like kind of stay on top of it. Um, and so we've gone from like updating everybody about everything all the right, time right, to being right. like, maybe we only need to talk about the stuff that's like truly off track, you know? Right. And so um, it's probably more a balance about asking the right questions to keep a finger on the pulse of how things are going. And um, there was a time where like the company would just sort of like turn on a dime. We were so small. And now that we're like bigger, there's a little bit more momentum and inertia behind it. And so very few things are so like catastrophic that if you don't deal with it right now, like it all falls apart kind of. So that's something I've actually had to like learn with time was to let more things go because I like to be hands on. I like to be in the details. Um, but like the company just can't scale like if we all do that. So you just have to find the right balance. But yeah, so trusting your team members. Yeah, communicating a lot. Let me build on that question. So one of the things I love about startups is the, the tough side is at the beginning you have to do everything. Like literally, mm -hmm. right? You're taking out the trash, you're washing mm -hmm. the dishes in the sink and yeah. all that fun stuff. But one of the great things about a startup is as you grow, you can start to gravitate towards the things you want to do and you can mm -hmm. hire people to do the things you don't really want to do. Where do you think you're going to, as you continue to have a more mm -hmm. and more narrow role, where do you want it to be? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think up until now, and this is, I think, how I've been on like my whole life, which is why sometimes like graduate school was hard because you're like, choose a specialization, and mm. you're like, but everything's awesome. <laughs> um, so for me, like, I, my role has evolved just by like, what did the company need to have solved? You know, what problem kind of came up or what challenge came up, and it was just like, yeah, okay, like we can do that. So it just became operations, just became this weird catch-all for like all the things that no one else kind of specifically put up their hand to take right um and Which that we just not care that it was doing well yeah so operations is sort of defined differently uh, depending on the company but um i guess it's hard i still actually don't have an answer to that question i love i didn't know that i was like an operations person and like no one teaches you in school what operations is but then it turns out that if you like to be kind of at the center of the action and you get to see the interfaces with all these other parts of the company mm -hmm. and you're very much like service oriented yes, yes. Um, because like regulatory affairs as an example isn't glamorous but if you don't have FDA approval you can't do anything <laughs> you know so it's sort of like like let's do that nitty-gritty work so that we can like open these doors for the business um, to walk through and so a lot of those uh, supporting functions um, lots of moving pieces, you're involved in a little bit of everything. Um, so that actually like for me, it, like I didn't realize that I love being an operations type person and it's a great opportunity. You don't have to have a technical background, but when you work in a technical, technical company, like we really consider ourselves a material science and innovation company, then that technical knowledge actually branches and like crosses over really well into thinking about, well, how do you talk about your product and its safety um, to regulators, how do you set like manufacturing specifications so that it's you know the equipment's like operating the way it should and performing the way it should, and so on and so forth. So it, I think right now in operations it's a great mix of um, science, which I'm really passionate about, um, but then being this central resource to the organization. The other part of my job that I haven't had a chance to really speak about is. Um, the VP of finance and I share HR right now too. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been, we've talked a little bit about, it's like, well, Jenny, like would a people path, you know, be one for you. I'm super passionate about our culture. Like we are nothing without our team and without our people. And we believe that it's a, it's a good goal into, in and of itself to just be a good company and treat our team members really well. Um, but I think I would still, I like want to stay close to that, but I would probably choose to formally do operations. What, however, that gets cut up and defined as we grow. Yeah. Yep. And I'll ask you about culture in a minute. Um, yeah. You mentioned service oriented, just to be clear to the students. I see that in you. I see that in your personality. I worked with people that, that had that gene. And it, what it means in a business is there's some parts of the organization that are outward facing, that maybe they're mm -hmm. customer facing. And then there's some parts of your organization that are more inward facing, helping other people get their jobs done. And that's what you mean by service oriented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so the company was initially funded with a grant from Bill and Melinda Gates. And I think my history might be a little bit off, but I've known James for a while. And then mm -hmm. what I remember is um, the focus on sub-Saharan African farmers. Mm -hmm. and, and Bill and Melinda Gates obviously have a, a, you know, a, a love of Africa and trying to help the continent in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, what, what relationship, and then the company obviously has gone in some different directions commercially, what relationships do you still have with the folks in Africa? I know there's some farmers and growers and things that you're, you're still working with, um, but I'd just love to hear how that's evolved and yeah, yeah. given the other directions you've gone. Sure. Um, so for folks who kind of don't know like this part of the story, our first ever um, fi financing or funding actually came from a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grant. Um, so there was a call for proposals um, and they have specific topics that come up. It could be maternal um, and neonatal health. It could be sanitation. Um, in this particular case, it was reduction of post-harvest loss and waste mm. in sub-Saharan Africa and technologies that could help with that. So for like a two or three page grant, you could apply for a hundred thousand, uh, sorry, two or three page proposal, you could get hundred access to a hundred thousand dollar grant of like seed financing. And what the Gates Foundation is great at is they want to place a whole bunch of bets. Like this is a big problem. Yep. There are lots of potential solutions out there. So let's see what we can kind of get off the ground. And what they told us was like $100,000 sounds like a lot of money. But once you start running your company, you start, you know, paying even meager salaries, like it gets eaten up really quickly. So yep. use this, leverage this to go and raise, you know, uh, more money using you know, because it's like, oh, like somebody else has already right. placed it. Somebody smart on this. has said, yeah. right? Somebody who we kind of recognize has already said, like, oh, this might be like a viable technology. So, um, to use that momentum, um, and so with that early grant funding, um, we kind of actually did travel and did work in the continent in addition to work like here in Santa Barbara running R and D, um, and so we've built out like kind of a network of farmers there now that's expanded beyond the original grant. So. The, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, their focus is really to kind of push, like bolster you through those R&D phases. We had a follow on grant for um, what ended up being another $1.5 million from them to sort of take it through a next phase. But they're not there with you to necessarily commercialize. Right. And so after a while, you kind of phase out of your grant and um, it's kind of on the organization to figure out how you're going to move it forward. So we actually employ um, a, a, for a student from the University of Kenya. He was a university um, student there and now is like an appeal employee who's like based in Kenya who continues to um, basically do work with smallholders in the area to test our formulations on their crops of interest. Um, but our big thing and it should happen this July is that we've been working towards regulatory um, approval to use the product um, in Kenya, in uh, South Africa and other um, kind of similar nations. And so a lot of it is he's been building out this groundwork so that we could, you know, have a chance to, to come in in the future. But um, so we, I think we, we just really use it to build out a network so that we're ready to launch um, once we kind of have the clearance to launch in that area. Yep. Yep. And I should have mentioned it earlier. Full disclosure, I put in a small amount of money at that time, very yeah. early in the company, mostly because I knew the people and trusted you guys. But there is a, a great role that grants play. So investors, mm -hmm. like professional investors, this was just a personal investment. As a professional investor, it would have been imprudent for me to invest in the company at that time because it was just so unproven. There was no traction. There was mm -hmm. no commercialization. And that's where SBIR grants, write that mm -hmm. down, come into play. Uh, the government is great at um, helping companies. Mm -hmm. The robotics company I was involved with, we lived on SBIR grants for years, DARPA grants, things like that. Those are there for you when you're too early for commercial investment. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a nice path to commercialization because they don't take any of your intellectual property. You don't yep. have to pay them back. Yeah, it's, and it's, um, it's what we call non-dilutive capital. So um, when you take money from like private investors, whether they be angel investors or venture capitalists, you, know, you do that in exchange for um, a percentage ownership in the organization. But when you take grant financing, um, it's it's called non-dilutive, so you're not giving them options or you know shares in your organization in exchange for that. Yep, yeah, it's great money. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So get as much of it as you can. <laughs> so I'm going to go to students' question after this one. Sure. So again, my memory is probably a little bit faulty, but what I remember is after the work in Sub-Saharan Africa and the mm -hmm. Bill and Melinda Gates, um, you guys went after orchids or some a fl an expensive flower, right? You were preserving. You were trying to yeah, see if you could Gerber preserve. Yeah, Gerbera daisies. So how? Did, oh, I had it wrong. Gerber I thought it was orchids. Daisies. So yeah. tell us a little bit about what happened there and then why you pivoted. Sure. 
So we were still in the garage at the time, um, James and I, the first like six months, we were like just near the Douglas Preserve, actually. Wow. The house is like right close to there. Yep. Um, you know, it was really, uh, I think, very well-intentioned advice from our angel investors that was like... Wasn't me. <laughs> like, hey, like, how do you kind of get a revenue stream just started? Um, you know, flowers aren't as regulated as food. Um, so, you know, what if you use your product in that market instead of the main kind of fresh produce market? So we said, that's, you know, good idea. It's a fresh cut, perishable product. Um, a lot of that also goes to waste. It's actually amazing what different people go through to ship flowers like all around the world. So if you've ever heard of like the floral auction market in the Netherlands, for example, mm, it's pretty tulips, crazy. Yeah. Um, so we were like, you know, this kind of makes sense. Um, and as we kind of went down that path, um, I think what we realized was, wait a minute, like we could make this work. And I think at the time we were converging more on technology that looked more and more like the existing technology for preserving cut flowers. And we're like, mm. wait, we're kind of losing the spirit of why we're really here and what we hope to accomplish. And so although it's going to be harder to do in food, we felt the impact was going to be um, much greater. Um, and so we just decided to really like not abandon it and put it on hold, um, come back and really focus, like double down on fresh produce. Um, and we think that's the right decision. And now actually the way the technology has evolved, it's actually going to be probably better for cut flowers than what we had really the first time. So there's an opportunity for us to go back into um, that market, like once we kind of establish our name and produce a little right. bit more. Which again is not uncommon, right? You mm -hmm. go down a few roads, you find the one that's most promising, and oftentimes you do go back, circle yeah. back to some other roads. It's funny because in my teaching, when I, you know, people say, oh, you teach UCSB, what do you teach? Entrepreneurship. And they, well, how do you teach that? And I, when I boil it down to maybe one sentence, I say, I think in the end, I'm, I'm, I'm letting students know that this is a viable option for them. Mm -hmm. If they don't do anything else, I think I did, I did something worthwhile. Because a lot of students do come in and they, they're thinking very vocation oriented, mm -hmm. you know, they're thinking engineering or yeah. one of the professions. Yeah. And the reality is entrepreneurship, it's not the right thing for most people. It's the wrong thing for most people, but just knowing that it could be an option for you, and especially mm -hmm. people in the sciences, you're the ones that come up with the great ideas, right? Business folks that do the selling and whatnot, we, we need great ideas. So if you feel you might have that inkling, it's better to experiment while you're in college, see mm -hmm. if that really is something you'd be comfortable with, get an internship yeah. at a company like Appeal, right? And then you might decide, no, it's not for me. Yeah. It's too, too much ambiguity, but at least you'll have tried it. Yeah, I think like the times have just changed. You don't go and it's like hard probably to go work at a place and just like start right after school and stay for life. Right. You know, so I think anyone who had the aspiration that working for like a larger established organization would give you stability, just like how things are now, that's just like not true anymore. You know, so it was sort of like things are probably going to change. <laughs> so, you know, just sort of like, um, yeah, just like kind of roll with it. Mm hmm. Yeah, gone are the days when the big company was stable. Now, yeah. now you get an, an email saying you're fired yeah. from somebody you never met. So. We do also say like one appeal year is like seven oh, yes. human years yes. kind of thing. Like yes. because you just have to come in, you like figure all this stuff out. Like I wouldn't be like a VP of operations at a big company right now. Like that's crazy, yeah. right? Yeah. Startup um, years. And like and like the 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 folks who do do that at that scale, like all the power to them and, and they've earned it, you know, over the course of their career. So I think it's like a unique position to be in because you just get your hands dirty on like a variety of different things. So if you have an openness to just learning <clears throat> and getting your hands dirty and getting the work done, like I think you'll actually be exposed to a lot of the business that you wouldn't have necessarily the opportunity to see in like a larger, more established organization. Yeah, at so. a much younger age. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned culture. Um, I, I want to hear your thoughts on, I mean, you have a reputation for a very highly collaborative, healthy culture. That's why I'm, I'm comfortable um, promoting the, to my students <laughs> as, an, as a potential career option. Thank you. What do you guys do to proactively curate your culture? And, and as the company has changed, have you been challenged? Or I mean, you have mm -hmm. to, it's, it's something you have to constantly be diligent about. Yeah. When we were probably only like 15-ish people, and at that point we just hired like our most trusted friends <laughs> and you go like and we were going through a hiring uh, like sprint which is like totally different because right now we've got like 70 open job positions mm. and so like at that time it was like a hiring sprint because we need to hire like three people right, that month right, you know <laughs> so it's all like relative 
Um, but we actually said, you know, we, would, we should probably memorialize what our values are. Um, because we were trying to communicate it actually through the recruiting process and like whether you know it or not every company believes it's got you know it has some form of values and it's looking for that in each of you as you interview so in this case it was like what was important to us what were we trying to get at through our line of questioning what we were hoping folks would demonstrate and so we actually sort of sat down and um, looked at other companies that we admired um, who had a really kind of like progressive people and culture and like a values stance. So at that time, like Netflix, um, their handbook, their employee handbook was like, like a PowerPoint slide deck. Yeah, and right. like, for example, um, spending company money, if you were expensing it for travel, it was like, spend the money like it was your own. Yep. Like that was their yep. policy. And so we we're like, wow, if you treat people like adults, like they might actually just like, live up to that yep. um, and rather than like punish the whole company when sort of one person made the wrong decision why don't we just go like deal with that one person mm -hmm. so that's kind of like how it originally started was like how do you set up a frame a framework so that every person who came on board kind of knew what the um, the guardrails were kind of like so that they could work within that but always um, be armed to make like autonomous decisions um, rather than have it be like pushed through the organization. Yep. It was also really important for us that we were like very flat. You know, the idea was that like good ideas can come from anywhere. And um, so a lot of it was in the team modeling, um, being open to criticism. So, you know, a lot of it maybe just comes from like a research background. Like you're just defending your research like all the time. You're presenting at Oof. research group meeting. You've got to present your thesis and like, Someone's like, well, why did you do this? And had you thought about this? And like, that just happens all the time. That's not a personal criticism. They're just there to help make your work better. So if that's really truly how you believe like feedback to be, and that, you know, an, an intern on their first day can ask our CEO a question like, hey, like, had you thought of this? And why do you do it this way? And he goes and he just answers your question like, like you're just your friends and you're speaking equally. Like stuff like that starts to permeate through the organization. That does so, get harder. Yeah. As you get bigger, it gets harder. It but gets harder but just from like a touch point. It's good points. to con continue to do it as long as you can. Yeah. So we have like an all hands meeting that's like everybody in the company once a week on Monday. And you actually get to hear from different parts of the organization present. You know, James stands up or I stand up and we address the group. And it's like, it's like open season. You know, hands can kind of. <laughs> flow up and so the fact that we'll be kind of like transparent and honest and a little bit vulnerable with everybody I think just has communicated that um, the team doesn't have anything to hide mm -hmm. and that we just got like full trust in um, and that's part of the culture an acknowledgement that you may not have all the answers but you're going to mm -hmm. figure it out and you're going to work hard to get it right and yeah totally yeah it's not a matter of we, we've got it all figured out mm -hmm. I think that gives people permission to try things and maybe fail, but yeah. but just keep trying. I just realized I probably need this face and like no, talk to you a little bit more. Like no, 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 this is group. working. <laughs> this is working. So I want to dovetail on culture a little bit. So yeah. um, appeals taking a leadership position in our local community when it comes to diversity and inclusion. I'm trying to get something going, and they've been very good about you know partnering with me, and 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 I'm quite flattered that they asked me to be on a panel that's coming up on inclusion. What concrete things is Appeal doing as a company? Just I know what, I know what they're doing community wide, but with inside the walls mm -hmm. of Appeal, what are you doing to make sure that you have a diverse and inclusive workforce? Yeah, I think this one, fortunately, it's come thus far, like organically, but we've been having active discussions that it's something that we we have to just work at. Um, going back to like if you know if you see it, you can be it. You know, how do you give more examples throughout the company of like the different ways in which you can. Uh, see it and be it. So up until now, I think it's probably been helpful that we're a mission-based organization that's mm -hmm. attracted like a really wide variety of folks. We have, it's like the majority of our staff might be like more, call it like my age group or younger. Um, but then we've got folks who just like, I love it, like come out of the word work, they're later in their careers and they're like, this, this sounds really great and mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm later in my career and I'd love to be able to have, to be able to say that I've been a part of this, you know. Um, and so our demographic is changing. We were hiring more like technicians and operators who work um, at our customers like facilities. So you have, I just love it because I just picture it as like my dad, like coming <laughs> to work 
and being like, it's pretty cool. I can tell my kids I work at a startup company and they're like, this is crazy. Like you're so hip, right, you know? Right. <laughs> so I think for us diversity, it comes in a variety of different ways. It's like, um, it's not just, you know, your gender and like how you look, but you know, diversity about what schools you come from, you know, as great as it is for us to bring in from UCSB, it's also great for us to bring in folks who kind of come from sure. other institutions as well. Hiring people with experience like outside of our industry, you know, more like seeding in um, that, you know, creativity really comes from being able to draw from these different um, aspects. Right now, we're, we're trying to be more targeted with our um, recruiting efforts specifically, because um, I think like at most companies, we, we actually, our overall organization is about like 40% women, just using this as one marker, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, not enough at like um, leadership levels. So if we say, you know, how do we work with our recruiters and where do we target some of our um, postings and advertisings so that we can actually bring in um, right. folks who are a little bit, can help us fill some of those gaps. Um, but even in our recruiting, we say to folks, so we actually actively encourage, like, you know, go and bring in referrals, but hopefully for people who are not exactly like you. Right. And so there's, they're more like these small and organic ways, you know, we'll build out, um, I think a more mature program as things go, but, you know, also sometimes targeting, um, you know, is it going to be maybe a more underrepresented community? Um, uh, folks kind of coming out of a community college or something like that, just to, to attract like a, a broader pool. So those are some of the just are really like granular um, approaches. Mm -hmm. um, and we hope a lot of it is just that people come to work and they feel like they can be their true selves. <laughs> um, and uh, in promoting, I guess, that kind of a workplace that they um, spread the word and, and tell other people to right, come. And attract like minded people. Too. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'll take the next student question in a second, but you touched upon one part of diversity, which is often overlooked in tech, and that's age. Mm -hmm. I had uh, Diane Flynn here um, who spoke to us, and she's created a nonprofit to help mostly older women, but not just um, re enter the tech workforce. And they're coming in at maybe age 45, 55, mm -hmm. and it's a different world from when they worked at 35. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's wonderful that you're that you guys have already identified that as it's not the uh, more obvious diversity which we all want and need, mm -hmm. but it's also a little bit. Let's not be ageist about it, right? Let's bring in some folks with some gray hair if they can add some value and some energy to the company. Yeah, just really trying to break like groupthink. How do you have the best kind of representation of voices at the table because we think that's where the best ideas come from? Yeah, diversity mm -hmm. of thought. I think when we go into you know like who is our customer like we're all consumers, you know? So a lot of times it's like, who are you creating your product for? Who is that market? Do you really like know and understand them? And so in this case, it's geographical diversity, mm -hmm. um, product category <laughs> diversity, yep. like other demographics that like, come into play too. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So I have just two questions. Um, you, you've won so many awards, I'm just gonna name a few. The, so the company was in mm -hmm. this relatively, I wouldn't even say relatively, it was an obscure company on the Mesa in somebody's mm -hmm. garage. And then all of a sudden, you guys, it felt like all of a sudden, right? Overnight success mm -hmm. took many, many years. Um, but you've won things like the World Economic Forum Technology Pioneer Award, Inclusion in Time Magazine's 50 Genius Companies. And I like this one because it's an industry award, the United Fresh Produce Association's Best New Fruit Product. Mm -hmm. I mean, that may sound like, what? I've never heard of them. But the fact that experts and insiders that are looking at what's new in this business are saying mm -hmm. this is important. Fast Company gave you a couple of awards, World Changing Ideas and Most Innovative Company. Uh, and CNBC named you one of their disruptors. So, and there's more. Um, what, but of all the accomplishments to date, of all the awards, what are you most proud of? Mm. I do want to actually, like, just one correction before I answer this. Uh -oh. uh, the company was technically started on like, a house in DP. <laughs> ah. so, <laughs> and then, like, upgraded to the Mesa because it had, like, a dedicated garage. <laughs> so for those so. of you that don't know what that means, it's basically adjunct student housing, right? Right. Where people sometimes <laughs> play loud music and do things. Yeah, yeah. So on Del Playa, like, on, on one of the streets, on, on that street there, it was actually where you know, it started in James's, like, bedroom, basically, there. But... Um, out of all the awards, the awards, um, I just, you know, it's a shout out, first of all, to our PR communications and marketing team to kind of get the attention of the right folks. Um, and for different, those awards speak to different audiences. You know, the trade one, um, United Fresh is an example. It, it's a signal to that audience right. uniquely. Um, but for speaking just like for myself, um, I think maybe the World Economic Forum one. Mm. 
Um, and so it's more because of what this sort of nonpartisan organization, um, its mission is. And so it's really like shedding a light on some of our biggest challenges around, could be climate, it could be gender equality, it is environmental, it is, and so it's highlighting this work like all around the world that could have um, like a major impact to really like quality of life overall for everybody. And so from like a truly humanitarian standpoint um, in a holistic sense, I think that one probably for me personally means the most. It's like why we, why I joined Appeal. Right. Um, and I think why <clears throat> a lot of people, you know, still come now and like it's the good that we hope to do in the world so um all, they're all meaningful in their own way but i think if i had to choose one that would mm -hmm. be my one right yeah now. that was a big one yeah um when you look back in 10 or 15 years and I, it's going to go by like that even though i <laughs> agree with you on startup years if they all feel long at the time yeah. what, what do you want the company's legacy to be how do you want people to perceive of what you have been able to accomplish yeah um this sounds tricky too because I think we also, I think we look at Appeal as more than a produce company. If we look at ourselves as a material science-based um, innovation company looking to put forward technologies that are more like inspired by nature rather than working apart from nature, then you can take those principles into a variety of different other industries. Um, but I think though we can have a big impact even if we were just in produce. <clears throat> so right now, the company is really rallying around a vision of uh, like a world without refrigeration. Um, and so like to just sort of put that a little bit into perspective, um, if you know, we've in the industrialized world benefit from this cold chain that we talked about. So fruit comes off the field and the first thing that farmers do is they try to get it like cold, like right away, pull the heat out. And then it's shipped on refrigerated trucks and then it goes into refrigerated storage and then maybe everywhere except you know, Costco, you walk into a refrigerated cooler to get your fresh produce. That's a bit weird. It's like no one else likes to do that, so they, so they keep it on the shelf. And then you go home and you like put it in the fridge again. <clears throat> but like there are literally just places in the world that aren't, don't have access to that infrastructure. Um, it either doesn't exist or if it does exist, it's not reliable. So the ability to buy more time is um, equivalent to kind of setting up the infrastructure so that that fresh produce that's harvested can actually make it to other end consumers. So we say that like <clears throat> if you're a smallholder farmer in Kenya, you grow mangoes, guess what? You're in a great mango growing re region. Your neighbors all have mangoes too. Like what are you really going to trade for? Um, and so it's about getting that out to a market to feed um, folks often like in urban areas and whatnot. So I think if we can actually truly connect you know, more of the worlds um, and provide that access to fresh produce and so that they didn't actually have to build out like a big cold chain infrastructure. Um, it's like kind of like a non-glamorous way to say like a world without refrigeration, but that's what a world without refrigeration could enable. Yep. Does that make sense? So all the Freon we don't have to deal with, all mm -hmm. the electricity that it takes to run all yeah. those refrigeration units. All yeah, over the world. exactly. If you could like increase the refrigeration units even by a few degrees, you know, um, and right now we're able to take, for example, asparagus that would be shipped by air um, to be shipped by boat instead and still arrive at the same quality. And that reduces the um, greenhouse gas emissions by like 47 times, for mm. example, because of differences in, in the mode of transportation. Then like those are the kinds of things that a world without refrigeration could look like. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we do great in produce, that's achievable. And I think if we are able to actually use produce as a first launching point and then taking these um, kind of technologies inspired by nature and push them into other fields, um, there's a lot more that can be done in, in other areas where we have challenges too. So right. that's just, yeah, just maybe and, hopefully the beginning. And even and that's something to be proud of. Even if appeal doesn't solve all of those problems, because you mm -hmm. probably won't, mm -hmm. um, just by inspiring others, maybe somebody watching this somewhere around the world or somebody in this room, just, just hel helping remind them that nature has a lot of secrets that we haven't mm -hmm. unlocked yet. And yeah. I think um, in our country, the last 100 years, we spent a lot of time on better chemicals 
-hmm. which was fine. That was a path we probably had to go down. But mm -hmm. it's, maybe it's time now to look back at nature and figure out how can we leverage what's worked for millions of years uh, and it's a bit healthier for everyone on this planet as opposed to a chemical made in a lab somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that'll be part of the legacy as well. At least I hope it is. Thanks. Yeah, the, the problems are all really big. <laughs> we can't be like a single right. silver bullet, like you said. So um, hopefully everyone else in this room feels like you can have a part in that too. Yeah, yeah. come on, go on out and change the world just <laughs> like Jenny's doing. Thank you so much for coming, Thank Jenny. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>